Welcome to another episode of our Rediscovering Conservatism webcast series, where we interview uh, leading intellectuals of the European and worldwide conservative movement. And today we are delighted to be speaking to my dear friend, Francesco Giubile. Uh, Francesco, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, you are the president of the Fundazione Giuseppe Tattarella, uh, named after the former Italian minister. You're also the president of Nazione Futura, which initially was a journal that you founded in 2017, and then gradually rose to become one of the more uh, interesting scholarly uh, institutions in Italian public life. You're also the editorial director at Giubile Regnani, which is a publishing house. You teach at Fortunato di Benevento University and held a visiting fellowship at Matthias Corvinus Collegium in Budapest, where I was lucky to meet you and share an office with you. You've written an impressive range of books, not least uh, Storia del, Pens del Pensiero Conservatore, which is published in, in English as the History of European Conservative Thought in 2016. And most recently, and perhaps most um, germane to our conversation today, You've also published a broadside on environmentalism and the rights approach to the environment and why uh, conservatives, in your view, ought to dispute the left's uh, monopoly of uh, the environment. Uh, this latest book was published in 2020 as Conserving Nature, Why the Environment is Dear to the Hearts of Conservatives and the Right. You're a sought out commentator on Italian public life. You write a regular column for the daily Il Giornale and were selected uh, and drafted uh, as part of the Italian government scientific advisory committee for the conference on the future of Europe. So I thought for my first question, uh, Francesco, we'll, we'll get right into it. Um, can you please walk us through some of the arguments in this latest book of yours about the environment? Why have conservatives conceded uh, and, and essentially uh, forfeited the issue? Uh, and, uh, and why have uh, people on the left claimed a monopoly on, on the environment? Yes, first of all, thank you very much for your invitation, Jorge, and uh, congratulations for these great uh, initiatives uh, in which you are working. It's quite important to listen to the speech and to listen to the ideas of some different uh, conservative people from all over the Western civilization, but also from all over Europe, because how you know, there are different schools of thought linked to the conservative world, so it's really important this kind of uh, initiatives. When we talk about um, the environment, we talk about a topic that is uh, really um, discussed in the last uh, um, five or six uh, uh, years, especially uh, before the COVID and especially before the war in Ukraine. The topic of the environment it was every day in the newspaper, was every day in uh, the media, and also the political landscape usually discuss a lot about this topic. This happened especially in the uh, European Union and also in the European country, but also in, in the United States is quite an important topic. But what is happening now when we talk about the environment is happening something quite similar to the culture. Uh, how you know, there are many important uh, intellectuals, writers, thinkers uh, that are linked to the conservative thought, who, which, who lived in uh, the, the last uh, century. And there are many writers and philosophers that we can define not only conservative, but the right people. And this kind of um, people are usually uh, not well known because the, the media and especially the, in the, the debate in the university, in the schools, are, is linked with the leftist culture. What is happening from the 1968 is happening that the leftist culture tried to uh, organize the culture, how Gramsci said in the famous um, uh, Quaderni, uh, where Gramsci explained the concept of the cultural hegemony. So it's happening that uh, if you are a conservative and if you talk about some conservative ideas in the cultural landscape, uh, sometimes this kind of idea, they don't have the, the same space of the leftist uh, world. And now with the environment is happening something quite similar. So if you, um, if you don't agree with the idea of Greta Thunberg, if you don't like the slogan of the Fridays for Future, if you don't like this ideological view of the environment, so that's meaning concerning to uh, some kind of view of the society is meaning that you are against the natural, is meaning that you are against the environment, is meaning that you are in favor of the pollution. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. But this is not true. This is not true because it, it, it exists, and especially existed in the last years, a very important a conservative thought link to the environment. There is the so-called green conservatism. But I think that there is quite a big problem. We have to split between the um, conservative thought in, in, in a cultural way linked to the environment, and in, on the other side, we have to talk about the political situation linked to the conservative parties because we have to be honest I think that sometimes especially in the western countries in the last years the conservative parties or the center right or the right parties they don't talk a lot about this topic and I think th th this was a mistake because they, they have to talk more about this topic and they have to explain how is important the environment. Because when we talk about the environment, we, we are not talking about, to, uh, the, about a topic that is linked to a, a political part or is linked only to, 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 to a part of the society. It's a problem of everyone. The pollution is a problem of all the citizens. And the, the link with the health is the thing that is linked to the human behavior. So it's important that the, all the political landscape has to talk about the, the, the environment problems and try to resolve the environment problems. So sometimes in the last years, the conservative parties, they don't talk about this topic in a good way. But in the same times, the cultural world talking a lot about this topic. I only quote Roger Scruton. I mean, Roger Scruton wrote an important book that is Green Philosophy. And in green philosophy, he explained how is important the concept of the green for the conservative. But he also brought out to think seriously about the planet. There are other um, important writers, also Edmund Burke. Edmund Burke talked about the, the concept of the nature. And I think we have to start using more the, the word nature instead of environment. And in the, in the debate today, everyone used the word environment. No one, you or ecology, no one used the word nature. But Henry Borg explained the importance of the concept of the natural. But there are also some novelists. I think about uh, Trudeau. I think about uh, Van der Berry, that is an American writer who talk, uh, wrote some interesting novel about these topics. But we can talk also about a European uh, cultural landscape linked to the environment. Ernst Jünger. Jünger is one of the most important German writers. And Jünger wrote a lot of pages linked to this topic. Also, in the Italian in, in media and, and the cultural landscape, there are some important, important writers who talk about this topic. I think to conclude this part that there are some uh, important topics that are linked to the green conservatism. First of all, we have to, um, when we talk about green conservatism, we have to try not to create a fight between the economy and the environment. Mm. The social economic um, situation is not uh, in, against the environment problem. So we have to try to find a solution. Second, we have to uh, talk about uh, um, a vision of the environment that is linked to the Christian vision of the society. If we read the, the Bible, in the Bible, there is the concept of the so-called creato. And the, the concept of creato is the man and the nature that are part of the same of the same group of things. So the man and the natural are not true enemies. Today we are living a vision that is linked also to, to Malthus, to, to, to a vision of the society where um, uh, Greta Thunberg and, uh, and th this kind of people say that we are too many people in, in, the, in the earth, that the man is a problem to the earth. And of course, sometimes the man do something that is not correct. For example, the pollution, for example, we build many, in, uh, many new, uh, new things that, that we don't have to build. Of course, the man did some mistakes, but in the same time, the man did a lot of things good for the health. And also our historical patrimony is part of our heritage. So uh, the, uh, the cultural heritage is linked to, to, the, to the natural. And, and the third point that is quite important is that we can't um, delay the, um, the, the issues linked to the, the, the lower class or the people who need uh, help from the society. We can't go to a person who has, for example, a car uh, by 20 or 30 years ago that is probably an old car which creates a lot of pollution, but we can't go to these people and say, you have an old car, 
and tomorrow you have to buy a new car that is cost, I don't know, 5,000 um, euros and uh, it's quite expensive for some people that don't have money. So what we have to do is try also to help the lower class people and not to create um, a vision of the environment that is a, a kind of uh, really, um, it's a vision of the environment that is linked only to the, some part of the society that it are only the rich people which can afford this economical transmission. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, as you, as you rightly said towards the beginning of your answer, this is an issue that all conservatives are, are having to grapple with. And um, the, the kind of case you make for why conservatives ought to uh, make a better case on, on the environment is, is, is applicable in Italy, but it's applicable in Spain, in Portugal, across Europe. And precisely on Europe, as we, you know, I wanted to shift gears a little bit and, and focus on uh, broader European issues, because a lot of your work and your public uh, 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 speeches and your writings have dealt with the issue of sovereignty. You're, you're a strong proponent of a Europe of nation states. And as I mentioned towards the, the introduction, you sit on the Italian government's scientific advisory committee for the conference on the future of Europe. Um, so very simple question, Francesco, as someone who was very, uh, who was very, who was advocated for uh, sovereign uh, nation states to collaborate uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a very sort of, um, not in a, um, in a supranational way, but in a, in a, in a, in a democratic way with one another. What's your, what, what do you expect from this conference on the future of Europe and what's, what's your role gonna be in it? I think the idea of the, of the conference on the future of Europe, it was a good idea. It was, uh, the, the idea was to try uh, to uh, talk about uh, um, the problem and the future of Europe with all the European citizens. So the, the idea, it was great. Uh, after the idea, there is so after the theory, there is the practical issues, and I think that concerning the practical issues, we we had to do more because um, in some way this conference was very unlucky because it started during the COVID period, so in a period where there are some, some big problems concerning the COVID, and after when the COVID finished in the last month that are this month, and the war started. So, of course, all the media and all the attention of the citizens is linked to the, um, the problem of the war. And, of course, it, it is normal. But uh, in the same times, I think that uh, there, was, uh, there wasn't a strong interest by the European Union, by the European government to push this conference in a really strong way. Because sometimes it's not so good to listen the, the word of the citizens because how you know sometimes the behavior of the normal people is quite different from the behavior of the Bruxelles establishment. I mean sometimes the position of the people is not linked with the, the ideological view that sometimes the European Commission have concerning some topics. We can talk about the topic of the border, we can talk about the topic of the migration, we can talk about the topic of the family, we can talk about the topic of the religion, and I'm talking about some crucial issues for the future in which the behavior of the um, establishment in uh, Bruxelles is quite different, I think, from the vast majority of the citizens. So I think that if the uh, Conference on the Future of Europe in, 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 will be developed in, in a stronger way. And uh, of course, in, from our perspective, as in, in the scientific committee uh, of Italian government, we propose to postpone the hand of the Conference of the Future of Europe. Because in an Italian perspective, we said that we didn't have the time to focus really in a strong way in this problem, in this problem, uh, program because of the war and because of the COVID. So we propose to postpone it. I don't know if the European Union will decide to postpone it. Probably they will decide after the French elections. But the, the point that is behind the Conference of the Future of Europe, and it's quite an important topic, is if we want a Europe of people, so a Europe which listens the behavior of the people, or in the, same, in the opposite time, if we want a Europe that is only linked to a small, I don't, I don't like a lot to use the word elite, because I think that the word elite is not a bad word. 
I mean, we, we need an elite. It's, it's kind of populistic to say that we don't need an elite. Mm. I think that we need an elite that is linked to the behavior of the people. That's mm. the point. The problem is not the concept of the elite in general. The problem now is this elite, is this establishment. That is an establishment that is not linked to the behavior of the people. But if we read some important writers like Fredo Pareto, Gaetano Mosca, or Roberto Michels, the so-called Teorici dell'Elite, these three Italian writers, they really explain how it's important to have a strong elite. In the opposite side, if we don't have an elite, what is the, the result? The result is Podemos in Spain. The result is Movimento Cinque Stelle in Italy. The result are this kind of populistic party that are not doing nothing of good because it's quite important, and you know better than me, Jorge, that you have to, to study, to know the things, to try to understand the things. And sometimes also because of the social network, when we talk about some really strong and difficult problems, imagine the war in Ukraine, that are really big problems. Now the debate is uh, you are, um, it's like to, to, to go to see a football match. So you are uh, in favor of one team or of the other team. And there is nothing in the middle. So in the same times, when we talk about the future of Europe, we are talking about some problems that are really difficult. And we need some great government which can govern in, in the right way the people. But in the same time, this kind of elite must listen to the people because this is a democratic process. It's not possible that the people go, decide to, to the polls, decide to vote for some party. And in the same time, the decision of the European Commission is the opposite of the decision of the people. So the, the real fight for the future is trying to build a Europe, of course, of nation, a Europe of people, but in the same time, a Europe which can respect the behavior of the, of the people who go to vote in the polls all over Europe. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, you're, you're going to be taking all of that, uh, just uh, all of that uh, philosophy and all the great insights you've just, you've just shared to the high levels of decision making in the, the Italian government as a, as a sitting member of this, um, of this scientific advisory committee. Uh, and precisely uh, speaking of Italy, uh, I wanted to turn to your, your home base. You're, you've obviously, you're, you're based in Rome. You've, uh, you've um, uh, spent most of your uh, life in Italy. Um, and, you know, uh, as, as I was uh, kind of writing out the questions for this interview, it, it dawned on me that Italy and France are two countries and I sit now in France. So the interesting thing is that Italy and, country, Italy and France are two countries where conservatives have had a very tough uh, choice between uh, two or, or even more candidates who who claim to be conservative, right? Uh, this has been the case in the in the presidential race that is uh, that is about to um, to finish in in France and in Italy. Uh, what I'd love to get your thoughts on is is the fact that uh, you know in, in in the early months of 2021, President Mattarella tasked uh, Mario Draghi, the former governor of the European Central Bank, with forming a government. And out of the two conservative parties uh, in Italy right now, only one of them, Lega. Uh, supported the government, whilst the other one, Fratelli d'Italia, stayed out of that uh, cabinet. Um, what kind of landscape does that uh, create? I mean, how, how should conservatives in Italy and how should conservatives at large in Europe should think about uh, Italian politics right now? What are some of the main areas of agreement that you see between Fratelli and Lega? And what are some of the sources of discord between the two parties? Yes, as you know, next year in the spring, we'll have the national election that will be quite uh, important. Uh, right now, the electoral system is made by coalition. Mm -hmm. So that's meaning that right now, but I, I, I say underline the concept of right now, because uh, everything can change in the, in the next, not month, but weeks. Uh, but right now, um, there is a coalition that will be made by the centre-right. So the three main parties will be uh, Forza Italia, a classical liberal party. Um, the leader is Silvio Berlusconi, that is um, quite old, but is still uh, present in the political landscape. And I think it can do the next uh, um, electoral campaigns. The second part is Lega by Matteo Salvini, that we can define a sovereignist party. And the third one is the brother of Italy, that is the right party, which is a, a becoming, a, want to become a conservative, a conservative party. So all these three parties are part of a coalition. 
On the other side, we will have another coalition that will be made by uh, the left, so Partito Democratico, and the leader is uh, Lecca, and uh, um, other small uh, center-right, center-left party, and probably also the Five Star Movement right now, led by uh, Giuseppe Conti, Conte, will be in the same coalition of the left. In the same time, there will be the possibility of creating like a central coalition made by, for example, Matteo Renzi or made by uh, Carlo Calenda, that is a European MP leader of a a small party, but increasing party that his name is Azione. And they can create like a a new center group. Mm -hmm. So the point for the center right is uh, understand if the center right can uh, arrive as first coalition. So if the center right will arrive as first coalition and will have the numbers to uh, of the majority of seats in the parliament, so if Lega, Forte Italia and Fratelli Italia all together will have the majority of the parliament, there will be a center right government. But if the center right will arrive as a first coalition, but without the majority in the parliament, so suppose, I don't know, 41 and the left, 38 and you need i don't know 45 to have the majority and so they miss some mps this is meaning that the president of the republic mattarella can decide to create a new technical government mm. so it's not impossible to have another drug government or it's not impossible to have another technical government not with Draghi, but with other um, leaders and if we will have another technical government, the question will be, which will, will be the, the, the party of this new technical government? Probably the left, probably the Feister movement, probably Forza Italia. And what about Lega and Fratelli d'Italia? I think this is the most important topic to understand. The most important topic to understand is if the center right altogether will have the vast majority to be in, in the um, to be in the parliament and, and to be the, the and to uh, say which will be the next uh, prime minister. This is the most important point. In the same times, there is like a competition inside the centre right between Lega and Fratelli Italia to understand which will be the first party, because historically we, uh, the party inside the coalition which will be the, the most voted will decide the prime minister. Is uh, an unwritten law, this isn't a law. So there isn't a law which says that, but there is an unwritten law, mm-hmm. a gentleman agreement, we can say, yeah. between the central right party. And if Brother of Italy and Fratelli Italia will be the first party, how the pool say right now, the thing is that Salvini and Berlusconi, they are trying to create an alliance inside the alliance. So they are mm. trying to create like a co-federation between Lega and Forza Italia to say, okay, you are Meloni, the first party, but you are one party, we are two parties, and our vote plus the other vote are more than you. So that's meaning that we have to decide for the prime minister. And this will be the real discussion in the next year, and this will be the, the next um, really tough point to understand if the center right will have the majority and which party will decide the prime minister if the center right win. But I don't want to say that this is clear 100%. I say that the, we will have many months to arrive for the election. Everything can happen, how we understand in the past, is that in, every, in a few weeks, everything can change. And in the same time, is really hoping the challenge between the center right and the center left. Yeah, absolutely. Very, very thorough and, and comprehensive uh, overview of what's ahead for Italian conservatives and what can happen if, if as you said, the, the coalition of the three right uh, wing parties um, uh, uh, obtains a, a majority in the upcoming uh, election. But I wanted to turn to a different country, which I think is, if not as important than, than uh almost as important as, as Italy in, in your view, in your assessment, which is Hungary. You know, as I mentioned, you've, you've spent a considerable, considerable amount of time in Hungary as a visiting scholar with, with Matthias Corbinus Collegium. Um, you've been following Hungarian politics very closely. Obviously, we had the elections on April 3rd, which if I remember correctly, you've been, uh, you were an, an observer. You were in Hungary when Hungarians went to the polls to re-elect 
uh, Prime Minister uh, Viktor Orban. But more, more uh, importantly, you've you've spent a, a, a lot, a lot, a long time uh, urging your your fellow European conservatives to take inspiration from what Prime Minister Orban has achieved in 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 Hungary. Um, let me put, put it very straightforwardly. What's your what's your assessment of uh, what happened on April third in Hungary? What's your assessment of the election? Um, Obviously, Orban was re-elected with an even even bigger parliamentary majority than than was the case before the election. But what what do you think are are some of the points that uh, that that should inspire uh, European conservatives? What things have been done in Hungary that other countries should should emulate, in your view? Yeah, how how you say the, uh, we know. I say you too. We know um, in, as foreign people um, in some way how is working the, the situation in uh, in Hungary. Uh, of course, uh, uh, Hungary is a, a, a really historical country. So, also if we spend some months and, and we usually go there, is it uh, require a lot of time to understand a country to understand people. So, uh, we have to say that we are trying and also to understand in, in a better way every day and every week. But in the same time, we, we are trying to study how is the situation in Hungary. And uh, um, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, Jorge, that uh, one of the most interesting uh, things uh, of the Hungarian situation, I don't want to talk a lot about uh, politics because we, we, we don't do directly politics. We, we, we do something that is linked to politics, of course, but uh, it's linked also to the cultural landscape, the media landscape, the university landscape. So <clears throat> it's something in the middle. And uh, what is quite impressive for Hungary is the vision of uh, the government concerning uh, the cultural issues <clears throat> and uh, the academic issues and the think tank of, and the foundation. That is meaning that you can be agree with Harbin, you, you can don't like Harbin, you can say, I like uh, a lot uh, what Harbin is doing. You can say, I hate what is Harbin doing, but what everyone I think has to recognize is that Harbin has a vision. Mm -hmm. So he has a vision of the future. He don't think about tomorrow, but he think about the day after tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And he has a perspective that sometimes our leader in Western Europe don't have, especially in my country. The problem is that we have a government for really a few months sometimes, or a few years, and the, the leaders usually only look to what is going to happen in the next months, in the next weeks, but not in the next five or 10 years. And this is the main difference with the Hungarian vision of the society by Orban. And what I like is that he invested a lot of resources, he invested a lot of money, he invested a lot of people in building a cultural, a cultural landscape that is linked to a vision of the society. So we were in MCC, but we can talk about, I don't know, the Danube Institute, we can talk about the Center for Fundamental Rights, we can talk about uh, Mandiner as a media. We can talk about uh, Maja Mantet, Maja Hidlap as a newspaper. So there is a really strong conservative landscape. And in the same time, so what is really interesting is that the Hungarian government or the, the Hungarian think tank and the, in the foundation landscape is really open to the conservative from all over Europe, from all over Western, in, in Western country. So right now in Budapest, there are, for example, many Americans. There are many people from Spain, many people from France, many people from Germany, and they are doing a lot of conference, a lot of uh, in interesting events. Next month, there will be the CPAC, for example. I mean, CPAC is one of the most important uh, uh, American events, and the European edition of the, the CPAC will be organized in Hungary. That's meaning that there is a vision. And I think it's quite important for the political landscape to understand that with only the politic, you can govern for two years, four years, three years, for one legislation, but you can't really change the society and you can't have the power for a long time. But if you understand that link to the political activity, that of course is really important, you, you built a media activity, you built a, a strong cultural activity, you mean a, a, you built a strong academic activities, 
you can govern for a long time. And again, I mean, we come back to what I said in the fourth part of the interview, we come back to Gramsci. That's what the left did. I mean, in my country, the left, we can criticize the left, we can say that they have a, a vision of the society that is different from us, but we have to recognize that they, they have a system, they build a strong system. They have all the teaching in universities, they have their media, they have their newspaper, they have their television, they have all their people inside the, in the industry of the state, they have all their people in, in the important part of the state. And in this way, you can create an hegemony. So I think that it's the time to build a conservative hegemony. It's not anymore the time for the leftist hegemony, but it's the time for the conservative hegemony. And that's why I have here with my publishing house is arriving, is a casualty I show you, it's arrived like two days ago, and we republished the book of Gramsci. Uh -huh. And you say, come on, you are, you can say, come on, you are a conservative, why are you reading Gramsci? I think we have to understand how our, I don't want to use the word enemies, but I, I want to understand how the people that have a different vision of the society think and sometimes try to, to build something that they do better than us in the past. But everything is changed and everything can change also in Spain, also in Italy, also in France. And in some way, from the, the foundation, think tanks and academic situation, we can see to Hungary how they're working and try to build a, a situation that in our countries will be similar to, to the Hungarian situation. Yeah, yeah. One of the, this is this has been a, an issue that I, I know is going to consume a lot of your work. Uh, you're you're going to remain very interested in what happens in Hungary, and you've got a very clear uh, understanding of what it is that is working in Hungary and that should be emulated in, in other countries. But but on that note, we uh, are uh, reaching the end of our conversation. This has been a delight uh, talking to you, Francesco. Thank you so much for for answering our questions and for being. Uh, for being a guest on this Rediscovering Conservatism webcast series. And to everyone watching, we'll see you again for another episode very soon. Thank you. Thank you, Jorge. Thank you very much.